Automated Daydreaming, The Five Lives of Bricker Cable Juice Written by William Pauley III Narrated by Connor Brannigan You may live to see man-made horrors beyond your comprehension. Nikola Tesla Police baffled after finding remains of Television Man On October 28, 2015, two Chicago police officers responded to a 911 call concerning a strange smell emanating from an abandoned church. Inside, they found human remains, mutilated and wired with electricity, along with evidence supporting the killer was one they'd been hunting for years, Dr. Perry Gordon. Two days later, a letter from Gordon arrived at the police station. He claimed the victim, airman Bricker Cablejuice, consented to his own mutilation, and that the two were in the midst of a great experiment at the time the police barged in. He also said the victim was still alive, even in his butchered state, and he could prove it. By connecting Bricker's brain into a computer via a surgically installed USB port, the police would be able to download his consciousness and read his thoughts in real time. The contents of the feed, however, would play out in a somewhat distorted and exaggerated manner, due to the brain being in a lucid, dreamlike state. In the letter, this process was called automated daydreaming. Following Gordon's instructions, the officers discovered he was telling the truth. The mangled remains were indeed alive. However, while reviewing the evidence, it was made painfully clear that Gordon's experiment went much further than just physical desecration. If the acts depicted in the feed turn out to be true, it would make Gordon the most heinous criminal the world has ever seen. But did these monstrous acts of violence even take place? Or was it all just part of the bizarre hallucinatory daydream? To whom it may concern. I am not a criminal, nor were my actions inhumane. He wanted this. Bricker. He asked for it. I've seen the reports and I've read the articles about him, about me, and they couldn't be more wrong. What they claim as fact is nowhere near truth. Bricker was not taken hostage. He was not held against his will. Again, he asked for this. I was happy to provide this service for him, and that I was skilled enough to have been able to provide this service for him. I believe we all have our gifts, something that comes more naturally to us than it does for others, and that gift is what gives us purpose. My gift is helping people, and that was why I felt compelled to offer my services to Bricker. It's as simple as that. I think we all know Bricker's gift by now, as the media has covered it extensively in the last 48 hours. And years ago, after falling from the plane, if you are able to remember that far back. It's been two full days since police found his remains, at least that's how it's being worded in the reports. What they found are not remains, well, at least not in the way they're making it seem. The random bits of his corpse, a bucket of entrails, the brain in a jar, those are not pieces of him. They are not his remains. What I mean to say is that what they found is all of him. Every bit. He is complete and absolutely alive. I understand the confusion why he was reported dead, and even the reasoning behind ordering a manhunt for his murderer, for me. I mean, to the untrained eye, he certainly appears to be dead, but that brain is more conscious and more aware than yours, or even mine. You see, Bricker is living in the multiverse. Let me back up for a moment. I'm getting ahead of myself. Everything alive on this planet exists in its current form thanks to mutations, and nearly four billion years of mutations at that. Mutations have made us more efficient in the ways of survival. Despite having only been on Earth for something like 200,000 years, humans have quickly climbed to the top of the food chain. Here, in present day, we are the most efficient and intelligent beings in the entire universe, as far as we know. We've never seen any creature greater than humans in our current form. 
Until now, that is. Bricker. He is a superior species. Our evolution. He's what's next. Through a wonderfully bizarre mutation, immortality, Bricker has been naturally selected to populate the Earth with the post-human. In his long life, he will have mated with countless women, most of which will all have children carrying his mutated gene and hopefully have Bricker's exact traits. Now, I'm sure this question will come up at some point, so I will go ahead and answer it now. Yes, I did approach his children, those who are now adults anyway, and they all refused my offer to study them as I have their father, and I have respected those wishes, honored them. I am not a monster. I am a man of science. Had Brecker refused me, I would have respectfully walked away and left him to his life. But Bricker didn't refuse. He wanted this. He needed me to show him why his gift was important, why he was special. He looked at it as a burden before I came into his life. He was severely depressed and found no meaning to his existence. He asked me to give him purpose, so I did. The media is making it out to be something it isn't, however. We had an agreement, a respect for one another, and most importantly, an understanding of how important our research was. We were changing the world before the police barged in and confiscated my equipment and Bricker. They aren't even concerned with our research, at least from what I can tell through reports. They are only interested in finding me. They want to put me to death for a crime I did not commit. They want to lynch me for bettering the world, our species and the future species, and for my many contributions to science. That doesn't seem like justice, especially when the supposed deceased is not even deceased. Which brings me to the purpose of this open letter. I am not interested in clearing my name, well, at least not primarily. It would be nice not to be hunted, but I'll deal. My fate is not the most important factor here. The work is what is important. The research. I am writing so that you do not discard of Bricker. Do not bury or do whatever it is police do with what they think are human remains. I am not concerned the burial will kill him, cause as I said before, he is immortal. Do with him what you will but you know just as well as I that it's just not good etiquette to bury or discard living things. It's not right, and Bricker certainly deserves better. Despite your coroner's observations, he is alive, and I can prove it. To anyone with access to the things confiscated from my lab, I'm presuming all of it is now labeled with the word evidence, Retrieve the red notebook and turn to the page that has the words Automated Daydreaming written across the top. It should be about two-thirds of the way into the notebook, and if memory serves me, the entire page is written in purple ink. This page contains instructions on how to download Bricker's consciousness onto any machine containing an accessible USB port. It is a live feed of his thoughts, as again, he is alive and the information comes quick in spurts of text, so it is probably beneficial to let it run for about an hour or so in order to get a good chunk of reading material. Just a warning, though. If you let the feed run for anything longer than an hour, you will see that the information loops, and you'll also notice that when it does, some of the information changes. This is normal. Bricker's mind is more complex than the human mind, as we currently know it. As I mentioned before, he is living in the multiverse. This is completely due to my actions, as I introduced certain machinery into his system that triggered this response. He agreed to all of it, of course. Sorry if it feels like I am repeating myself. I wanted to be absolutely clear that I had Bricker's consent. Before ever knowing Bricker, I was working hard on creating this device to provide evidence to help support the many worlds theory. The idea that we all exist in perhaps an infinite amount of universes, or dimensions, all at the exact same time as what we perceive to be our primary existence. In each of these dimensions, we all exist in an infinite amount of ways, doing everything and being every type of person possible. 
quite literally, in theory, we all exist in every way possible, have been everything, have seen everything, and have said, touched, tasted everyone and everything in existence. My device only explores five of these worlds, possibilities, or channels, as I prefer to call them. The live feed you'll download of Bricker's consciousness will have explored each of these channels, and may switch back and forth through each, seemingly at random. Bricker controls this. Oh, and you should also be warned that as time goes on, each of the channels typically become even more outrageous and outlandish than the ones that came before it. Before each loop cycle resets, that is. I know, it's a lot to take in. It may not make complete sense to you now, but once you read the text from the live feed, I assure you all of this will process a bit more smoothly. I should also add that in all the years I've spent analyzing this data, I've found that the facts and specific details of major moments in Bricker's life are still present. However, at times it can seem somewhat distorted. Everything that ever meant anything to him in life, that is to say his life in his present universe, is buried deep within the bones, inside the structure of the stories of each of the lives looping continuously within the realms of each channel. You'll have to sort through the fiction to find the facts, but I promise you it's all there somewhere. So pay attention. Good luck. Oh, and I'd appreciate it if this letter and the automated daydreaming feed were published as proof of my innocence, and to set the record straight with the public that Bricker Cable Juice was not murdered. He is in fact alive and well, and functioning better than ever, paving the way for our inevitable post-human society. This isn't necessary, of course, and I'm honestly not even expecting anyone to do so, but it would be helpful to both me and anyone working within the field of science. This study is important. The results should be analyzed and used as a stepping stone for the eventual release of consciousness from the prison that is the human brain. One small step for man, one giant leap away from mankind. That's catchy, huh? However, again, the important thing here is to realize that Bricker is still alive and should be treated as every other living being, if not better. He is the key to the future of mankind, in whichever shape or form that may take, and his importance should never be reduced to anything less. Thank you for your time. Signed, Dr. Perry Gordon, formerly of Uric Labs. Automated Daydreaming Channel 41 Nosebleed Slash Cable Juice Part 1 I remember the nausea. Then everything went black. There wasn't a memory for days after that. Maybe there was, but I certainly have no recollection of it now. All I remember is the heavy feeling in my gut as I stared down at the world, thousands of feet below me. Little houses on the hill all looked like little pills to me, and the guy behind me pushing against my back. I was the only thing standing between him and the all-American feeling of freedom. Freedom in the form of nothing. In a swallow. In a fall. I'll be the first to admit I was frightened. Days before the jump, we were all men. Red meat-eating, fist-pounding, beer-guzzling men. We fucked our wives and came on their naked breasts every night a game wasn't on, as man as it gets, by God. But in that moment, standing up there in the clouds, where man was never intended to be, and looking down at the expanse of civilization below us, and realizing in that moment, too, that mankind are no more than insects, Looking down at our anthills from the view of God's eye was when I first felt the nausea swirl inside my stomach. We were not men. We were drones, robots, followers of the machine. Standing there on the edge of the plane, as I was trying to get myself to man up and jump, my knees buckled, I tensed up, and lost all memory of everything I had ever known. In an instant, I was nothing. In the next instant, 
I was falling. Someone pushed me. Someone behind me on the plane, another soldier, one that was either more man than me for his bravery or less man than me for his ignorance, grabbed me by the pack and shoved me out the back hatch with all his might. I was falling. I knew I was falling, but I felt nothing. I knew how fast I was traveling. My body knew the precise moment to expect full-on collision with the earth below, but my mind was wiped, tired, and traumatized. I could not get my hands to pull the parachute release to save my own life. As much as I tried, I could not think of a single reason to do so. I continued to fall long after the other soldiers' shoots had all blossomed. The farther I fell, the faster I fell. My body became hard like steel, like an atom bomb dropped from a plane. In that moment I was atomic, delivering my own personal doomsday. I was a shell. I was delivering the weakest message from God to the people of Earth. I was absolutely nothing. The minute it took my body to jump from the plane to collide with the Earth felt more like hours, days maybe. I thought of everything and nothing all at once. I was scared. I was brave. I was something otherworldly. When I hit the ground, it hurt, but not like it should have. In reality, my ass and my boots should have both met the ground by passing through my flattened skull, but it didn't happen that way at all. In fact, all I felt that day was a little pressure on my face, enough to break the cartilage in my nose and cause a little bleeding. My face hit first, buried itself a few inches in the ground. I landed out in the dry, cracked desert, and my body followed as it skidded out about one hundred feet. Then my legs, which were hanging over my skull like wicked tree limbs, finally fell to the ground. A cloud of dust engulfed me. I wish I had a better explanation for it, something interesting, something provocative something that would help answer the many questions everyone had for me afterwards. How I could fall from a plane speeding through the clouds for thousands of feet, crashing into the earth at God knows what speed, and come out with only a nosebleed. But I have nothing. I've only recently remembered these details. It's been something like two months since the fall, and this is all that's come back to me. Maybe something will happen, like a dream or a stumble. If I hit my head against something hard, then surely I will remember, as it always seems to work in the movies. And suddenly, I will remember everything. Until then, there is only this. I am Bricker Cable Juice, the human glitch. I wasn't sure why this memory was always the beginning of the cycle, as it was a memory from many years ago and so far back in my past that it didn't make any sense for it to be placed before the memory that always played out next. Where were all the other memories, the first ones from the years between? I deduced that this first memory came from the year 1949, given the event took place during my stint in the military. I was honorably discharged almost as quickly as I was enlisted, after falling from the plane, understandably. The memory that immediately followed was a memory occurring many decades later. Fifteen, to be exact. Channel 41 When I looked out the window this morning, I saw an old man sitting down at the bus stop. When I say an old man, I mean a man of the age of eighty. When a man is eighty, he feels eighty. He's an old man. No two ways about it. Bones become weak and frail. Legs walk slower. Mouth talks slower. Lungs breathe slower. Everything becomes difficult. Even the easy things in life like checking the mailbox, become difficult, some days even impossible. A man longs for death at that age, and the only good thing about it is that he's nearly there, it's within reach. 
Men are crumbling ogres at the age of eighty. I should know. I've been eighty twice already. It took me an hour to get from my bed to the window. Getting to the window from my bed in a single hour is major progress for me. Seems I've mastered the system. I have pushed myself to the limit and now can fill my day with twice as many activities as before. Filling my day with activities has only recently become a concern of mine. Before, I used to lay in bed most of the day, not even getting up to shit or piss. I'd let the nurses worry about it. I used to laugh about how long those gals had to attend college, how hard they'd have to work, just so they could wipe up someone else's shit. They're all glorified janitors. Babysitters. I don't laugh about it anymore, though. Life for those people is so short. Wasted time in a life that short is the greatest shame. Wasted time for a man my age, a man of 163. Seems like it'd feel the same as 50 pound weights around the ankle of an eagle. So I can't imagine how it must feel for normal folk. I'm not saying I'm not guilty of it, too, because I am, and I'll be the first to admit it. Like I said before, I've wasted quite a bit of my life, nearly all of it, to be completely honest. I've taken my life for granted time and time again, and I've even spent a good portion of it trying to end it. My body has been abused in ways that would have killed other men, and I have the scars to prove it. I used to think this body of mine was a curse. But now I know it's more than that. I kick myself when I think of all those years I spent lying in bed, depressed as all hell, wishing I was just like those other folk, normal folk. Surely I was put here for a purpose. Surely God had a reason for me. Okay. I'd like to keep this here confession honest, so to do that, I have to admit now that I really never have been much of a religious man. I'm not entirely sure what I believed in before, if anything at all, but if I dig real deep, I can say that I most likely always knew that there was something more to life than just living, fucking, and dying. There had to be. Even before I ever suspected my immortality, or what I assumed was immortality, I was getting older, my body was aging, I was an eroding collection of bones in a thin sack, but I would not, could not, die. Or at least I hadn't. Yet. I had an undeniable feeling of a consciousness living somewhere within the air that surrounded me. What I assumed was the presence of a higher being. But what was that higher being, and how did it relate to me and my role in the world? I had this and countless other questions in my mind, always, even now. Only now I'm not too afraid to dive into the unknown. Just too old. This reminds me, I was a scared child. Everything from shadows to water, I feared it all. I used to be convinced that the devil lived inside my ear hole. I swear to God I could hear the demon banging on my eardrum every single goddamn electric night. I can't say it was the devil for sure, but something was in there. Something unnatural. Maybe even supernatural. I used to try to drive the little bastard out. Weird things like sticking the sharp end of a pencil inside my ear, piercing the eardrum, or years later pushing a lit cigarette into it, scorching my ear flesh. Ended up causing permanent damage to my hearing. Even to this day, in my left ear, the world still sounds like the inside of a seashell to me. Bricker, the demon used to say to me. Bricker, you're a goddamn wolverine. You can't teach your tricks to anyone. 
No, son, you were born with it. You're a goddamn wolf cat. I never felt like the demon really ever knew me at all. Of all the years, of all the tragedies, of all the triumphs, I thought that damn demon would have figured me out a little better than it had. It never felt real to me. At least that's what X tried to get me to believe. I don't have a single thing to say about that man. I refuse to speak about my encounters with him. The man was a tyrant and I wasted a good portion of my life pouring out to him. I will not spend any more time speaking his name and retelling his teachings. I won't have it. I did, however, find it strange to be staring down at a man half my age that caught my eye initially because of his striking resemblance to X. Could he have had a younger brother? It seemed impossible given all I knew about the man, or at least very unlikely. Although I never saw X as an old man, his appearance when I last saw him was that of most fifty-year-olds. I was certain that this man, the one I was staring down at through this nursing home window, could not have been him. X would have to have been much older than this man. X would have surely been dead by now. No way in all of hell that the man on the street was one and the same. In all of hell. No way. I stood in the window most of the day. The man never moved from his place on the bench. Buses came and went, but the man did not budge from his position. I was convinced this was not him. However, I did not look away from him, even for a second, the entire day. Only once did he move. Once. For a while I was convinced he had sat on that bench and died there, perhaps frozen to death, or maybe his heart had given out, I thought. But I was proven wrong the moment he moved. Yes, he moved. He looked up at me. He raised his head and looked straight at me as I stood in the window staring down at him. He didn't look around. He didn't catch a glimpse of me out of the corner of his eye. He looked directly at me. There was no emotion shown on the man's face, not from what I could tell anyway. My eyesight is terrible, exactly what you might imagine from eyes as old as these. I could definitely see the shadows that hung over his eyes and across his cheeks, though, and behind the shadows, although blurry, those eyes, the whites of his eyes burned images into mine. Spectres, ghosts, they were all there, as they always were, in X. His stare made me remember things and forget them again, all within seconds. So many images, memories, reveries danced before my retinas. Then they were gone, and that was all. That was all he did from that moment on, stare. I did not turn away. The invisible ropes of tension wrapped themselves tightly around our eyeballs, and our stares dared the other to walk across the line into the unknown. At this moment, I knew it was X. Had to be. Then, for no reason at all, I fell asleep. I wasn't even tired. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, I had just woken up an hour before. My eyelids grew heavy, and I fell into unconsciousness all within a fraction of a second. Clouds of darkness swirled around the room, opened its hot mouth, and took me inside it. The world would appear much different to me the moment I'd awaken. That night, I dreamt about honeybees. In the dream, the bees were all disappearing, fleeing from their hives all at once, overnight, complete and total abandonment. The only bees that remained were the queen and the many younglings. No telling where the others had gone. But I knew. I knew because I had been to this place before, the place of erasure, of erased things. 
colony collapse disorder, that's what they called it. For one reason or another, an entire colony would vanish. I thought about this as I slept, what it meant to completely disappear from the world and how something could leave everything it's ever known, the only place it ever called home, for emptiness, for darkness, for complete nothingness. I couldn't relate to the idea myself, but it made me dream of other humans and what would happen to them if they all had suddenly disappeared, vanished, without a trace, gone. I suspected it would have been much quieter, peaceful, that is, given what was left roaming this godforsaken planet wasn't worse than humans themselves. There are worse things than humans, after all. Much worse. I had seen them, and unbeknownst to me at the time, I'd be seeing them again, there in that very dream, or what seemed like a dream to me then. Soon I'd be seeing everything again. Everything I'd ever done, all the good, all the bad, would soon be playing back to me. Some of the sins were unspeakably horrid, but I am nothing if not honest. No matter how terrible a person this makes me out to be, it's the truth. Memories arrived in the form of ghosts, and they vanished as quickly as they appeared. This has been Automated Daydreaming, The Five Lives of Bricker Cable Juice, written by William Pauley III, narrated by Connor Brannigan, copyright 2016 and 2021 by William Pauley III, production copyright by William Pauley III.